uh, as far as community development is concerned. And uh, we have found an outstanding speaker tonight that I think you will thoroughly enjoy and you will learn an awful lot about developing your communities. And that's what we want to try and do in the three county area that we service, Chesterfield, Marlboro, and Dillon County. Mr. Quint Stutter, Stutter is a businessman, he's an educator, he's an entrepreneur. And he knows what he's talking about because he's done these things all of his life. He started out actually in education, then he went into hospital administration, and then he got into motivational speaking. Uh, he's based out of Pensacola, Florida. Uh, he has a company that has about 250 employees and they work all through the healthcare and educational field. The most important thing is that he helped redevelop Pensacola, Florida. I don't know how many of you have been to Pensacola, Florida in the last several years, but it's not the same place it was 20 or 30 years ago. And Quint has got a lot to do with that, and he's going to talk about that a lot tonight. He's traveled all over the United States, and one of the things he noticed is that different communities have a different viability, if you will. And so what he started zeroing in on is what makes a community viable versus one that is not. And part of that secret he's gonna share with us tonight. So I'm delighted to welcome him to our group and we're delighted to have all of you here. Quint, you're on. Thank you, sir. Well, thank you very much. Um, I'm gonna go over here so people over here can, can see me. It's, it's nice to be here. Um, you got a great technical college. You're very fortunate. It's sort of interesting. Everything swung that way. You know, so many technical schools got out of being technical schools because they thought they had to be four year schools. And they walked away from job training, workforce development, and then the industry, the whole world is swung that way now. Anybody ever watch TV and see that Mike Rowe who talks about jobs and job training? I always tell people, my wife ever leaves me, that's who she's leaving me for because she absolutely loves him when he comes on TV because he talks about job training, job development. Um, I was a special education, vocational education teacher. So the students I had, my job was to get them in jobs. And I told the story to the, um, some of the people at Northeastern Technical College today about um, when a person has a job, what it does to their life, what it does to their, their feeling. Um, it just makes a difference. I was telling the story about Barb who worked at um, McDonald's. We got our job at McDonald's and um, she worked afternoons, usually the, the after lunch, so it wasn't as busy. Maybe she'd work like one o'clock to three, three, four o'clock. That is her first job and she loved it. And that was years ago when McDonald's had the purple pants outfit they were always wearing. And I was telling the story that, um, you know, on days that she'd go to work, we'd expect her to wear her McDonald's outfit. And all of a sudden, one day she comes to work and she's got her, or comes to school, she's got her McDonald's outfit on and she doesn't work. Now we just assume she got messed up on the schedule. We sat down with her to explain to her that she didn't work that day. And she knew she didn't work that day, but she still wore her McDonald's outfit. Because on days she wore that McDonald's outfit, kids didn't call her retarded. Didn't, uh, kids didn't call her spec ed. So I think jobs have a lot to do with, with life. They, um, Bruce Springsteen, they interviewed him years ago, and I said, I, well, you write a lot about work. Why do you write so many songs about work? He said, because my mom had a consistent job, and I saw how she felt about her life. My dad didn't, and I know how he felt about his life. So what, what happened to me, and that's all my contact information. That's my cell phone, uh, the number. When I was president of a hospital, I gave it to every patient that came to the hospital. So every patient would get my cell phone number and it'd say, if there's any reason you don't feel you're getting well taken care of, um, call me. And people would say to me, does anyone ever call you? And, and not much, but they did. I remember one call one day, um, lady calls me up on a Sunday night and she says, my aunt is having heart surgery at your hospital. I love my aunt, is your hospital any good? And I said, well, I'm the president of the hospital, so I'm gonna tell you it's good. But let me do this, let me get your, Got, get your number, let me call the director of cardiovascular surgery. And if he's awake, cause it's like 10 o'clock at night, he will call you and let you know about our heart program. Now I didn't hear, like she never called me back that night, 
But later in that afternoon, to sort of forget what even happened the night before I'm at work, my secretary said, some lady came by that you talked to last night, and she said, thank you. Forgot all about it again. We went, I'm hearing impaired. I'm deaf on one side. I hear only a little bit on this side. So they, uh, it was some type of disability week in our town. So they invited adults that had some type of need. And you sat at a table and then you got up and sort of talked about it because they wanted to see that people were having some success with various challenges in their life. So I, I got up and they told them about I'm hearing impaired speech impediment. And, um, and, um, I, and I always pro made promises. I said, if you come to Baptist Hospital, here's what I guarantee you. Nobody will walk by you without saying, can I take you to where you're going? When a nurse leaves the room, she'll say, is there anything more I can do for you? I have, have time. Um, yeah, those two things I would say, I'm sorry, two things. And, and all of a sudden this lady raises her hand. And I'm thinking, uh-oh. You know, you're president of the hospital and somebody raises their hand, you're thinking, uh-oh, what happened? She goes, I just wanna tell you what he said was true. My aunt had heart surgery at that hospital six months ago, so you can never tell. So I own a minor league baseball team in Pensacola called, Pensacola called the Pensacola Blue Wahoos. On the video board, we give my phone number out the third inning of every, do, uh, every game because I want people to have experience, so it makes a difference. So please, that's it. Two books down below, the one on the Busy Leader Handbooks. I've written quite a few books. That was um, just hit, uh, hit about a year ago, number five on the Wall Street Journal bestseller list. And building a vibrant community, um, you can have a free copy today. Um, if you if you bought it, you bought it too early. But anyway, if you, um, or else you can get a free copy. Now, if you do buy it, every single dollar goes to early brain development. Um, my wife and I take no money. So sometimes it's not like our profits. We pay for the printing, and then every single cent goes to early brain development. And I'll talk a little about why that's important to me. I have a new book coming out in June. Whoop, let me turn this on, I forgot again. So how did I get into this and why the book? Um, I, was pre I was president of a hospital and then I started my own company called The Studer Group and it started doing really well. Um, I lived in Gulf Breeze, Florida at the time. I didn't even live in Pensacola, I lived across the bridge. Um, I would usually hang out at my house. I'd go to the airport or the mall. That was my, my life pretty much at that time. Um, and in 2004 or five, I got a contacted from Jim Clifton, who was the pre, who's the president even today of Gallup Corporation, chairman of the board. And he said, I'd like to talk to you about your company. We noticed that hospitals you work with outperform those that you don't work with. We'd like to study your company to see what you're doing in healthcare. So I was real excited about that. I flew to Washington, D.C. They have a small corporate office in DC because they're so involved in politics and 800 employees in Omaha, Nebraska. In fact, they were in Lincoln, Nebraska. Gallup was born in Lincoln, Nebraska. It came out of the University of Nebraska and they're in Omaha. And I said, how'd you end up in Omaha? I said, well, they invited us over. He said, I hadn't talked to anybody in Lincoln so long. I didn't even know who to say goodbye to when we were leaving. And I'll talk a little bit about making sure you retain the businesses you currently have. So while we were getting a little tour, he's very pleased with the work they've done in civil rights. He's very pleased with the work they think that they've done to help sometimes give America and the world information. He said, we have just finished the largest study ever done on economic development. And he called it economic development. And he said, it's why do some communities thrive and some don't? He said, most people think it's just location and it isn't. People think if you're in the Southeast, you have an advantage because you're in the, the Sun Belt. He said, well, tell that to the people in Portland, Maine. So how come Portland, Maine is thriving and Bangor, Maine is not? How come certain cities are? And so I got interested in that and I'm gonna talk about that. I actually brought him to Pensacola to do a community talk, something like this. And that started my journey of 16 years ago. So I'm gonna walk through a 16 year journey at times. And I bring that up because it's a journey and it's crawling before you're walking, it's walking before you're running and so on. But once he turned on the light for me, I couldn't turn it off. It's like anything else. I went to um, a family dynamics course one time. And when I walked out, I looked upon things differently. Just when the light goes on and we get new information, we no longer can look at things the same. 
So we did it from work, but I didn't plan on writing this book. And then about three years ago, my publicist, who lives actually in Hickory, North Carolina, said, you should write another book. And I thought she meant Busy Leader Handbook, which I ended up writing. She said, no, a book on how to build a community. I said, there's got to be a lot of those because I'm not an urban planner. I'm not an engineer. I don't do any of this stuff. She said, yeah. So I said, do some research. So she did research and there's great books out there. Chuck Marone has written great books on Strong Town. Jeff Speck on walkability. There's so many great books, but they're usually written by engineers or planners, nothing wrong with them, but they've never done it where you had a referendum. They've never done it where you have challenges that you have when you move a community. Because while some people want a community to move, some people want it to stay the same. And that's it. Some people like it to stay the same because labor's cheap, land cheap. And some people want to grow it and it just ends up being a different, one, different world. One of my favorite chapters in the book for, um, especially for elected, are you an elected official? Is consent versus consensus. Because what we find is people want consensus and when you, time you get consensus, it's too late. It's over and it's not the project that originally was. Um, but so by mean by consent, it means the people that don't get their way, even though they don't get their way, they still say, we're still gonna do everything we can to support the way the city's going. Still happens today. We just approved a, port, a boat manufacturer in Pensacola downtown where our port is. I was very much against it. You create more truck traffic downtown, the whole bit. The city council voted for it. I'm 100% gonna make sure I do everything I can to make that boat company success. That's consent versus consensus. And we'll talk a little bit more. So I wrote this book and it's been a, been a lot of, a lot of fun. Um, it's, it's small ball and I'm a baseball person. So it's not home runs. It's not grand slams. It's a whole bunch of singles. Now I wouldn't do this if I didn't have some statistics. I'm, I'm a huge believer in measurement. Almost every city I go to tells me quality of life is important. I was just in Colleen, Texas, on night, not what, three weeks ago. And the chamber got up and said, quality of life is important. The economic development people said quality of life was important. The mayor said quality of life was important. The city manager said quality of life was important. Everybody said quality of life is important, yet nobody measured it. And most cities don't. Yet there's a good tool by the Mason Dixon company that measures quality of life for communities. And it measures it in a number of areas. And sometimes you like what you see and sometimes you don't. Um, we did it the first time in 2008 and only 27% of the people, there's one question that says, are you moving in the right direction? Only 27% of the people said we're moving in the right direction. Now, I will tell you some people, I don't know about you, but if you ever notice when people don't like the survey results, it's an invalid and unreliable survey. And when they do like the results, like if I get on a scale and it weighs me light, I do not question the scale whatsoever. So we had some people not like this. In fact, the people that fought it the most really struggled from then on. When, even when they were in office, they didn't get reelected because the community that, that filled it out, that's how they felt. And it's a very cell phones, different, you know, make sure it matches everything. Today we're at 64%. Now you might say, well, that's not that good. I have now done this enough in enough cities. I think if you can get to about 70%, you're a Clemson. In football. I mean, because it is hard. And that's the other thing I've learned. I actually, we actually hired a polling company and, and Bruce Barcello, I always give names, and they surveyed our community when we first started this journey. And they surveyed it on positive and negativity. How positive in your community, how negative is, or how optimistic and how pessimistic. So they'd ask questions that they would assume would get a positive answer. Like, you're gonna have all the money in the world and boom, boom, boom. Now, if you're a negative person, you're gonna say, what about the tax consequences of that? If you're a positive person, you're already out there having a good time and you're probably donating a ton of it to make your life a lot better. 33% of our community were classified as negative. He said, if Pensacola put an RFP out for heaven and heaven chose Pensacola and moved, God moved heaven downtown Pensacola, 30% of the people would not want a gated community in their downtown. So that's sort of, and, and I think we have to realize that because we spend so much energy trying to get people on board that won't get on board. 
Should we try to get as many people as possible on board? Absolutely. But you get to a point where you got to move forward and you can't please the unpleasable. And sometimes we do that and we run out of oxygen. There's a whole chapter in my book on that. We've had a 34% increase in property value, which is positive because in Florida, you're very limited. You can't raise taxes hardly at all. So that means that's new development or renovated development. We've had a 67% increase in downtown investment. In 2019, we were named one of the most desirable cities to live in the nation by the US News and World Report, the 17th best city to start a small business by Verizon. In 2013, Palafox, our main drag, was named one of the 10 great streets in America. We also have some new data. We have a CRA district in our community and been flat for a long time. And I ask you to not, not compare because we can all compare ourselves out, but just relate. Don't get caught up on the numbers, get caught up on the increase. So in 2010 and 2011, 2012, we were pretty much from stagnant. And then things started popping around 2012. It took us about three to four years to get some energy. And you can see today what that looks like. Now that is good news because that creates sustainable financial, uh, financial stability for your city. And I know we have multiple cities here. And thank you for being here. And, and where does that go? That goes for schools. It goes for cat. It goes for police. It goes for fire. It goes for safety and safety and education, which is paramount in, in any type of community. You don't have safety. You don't have anything else. One of the questions on the quality of life survey is how safe do you feel? Another one is if you're a, how welcoming are your people that are different than you? Another one is how easy is it to start a business in your town? How easy is it to grow a business in your town? Those are the type of questions in the quality of life survey. So what, what happened to us over the last, and I'm gonna go back 50 years. And I don't know your community. I know a little bit about it. I know you got a great technical college and that's a big plum. And I'll talk about why in, in a little bit. If you remember most communities and I do, I remember going downtown to Sears where I grew up. I remember going downtown to the movie theater. I remember all these things. In most of our communities, most of it was driven by local organizations. We had local banks who would easier to small, make a loan to a small business if you're locally owned. You had local media, local media, whether it be newspaper, radio, and so on. Local healthcare, you don't have a hospital anymore, so you know exactly what I'm talking about. And you had a lot of locally owned businesses. And that's very vital because not only did you have money from them, but you had intellectual capital from them. So in Janesville, Wisconsin, where I spent a lot of years, and many of you might not remember this, there was a very high end pen at one time called a Parker pen. Every president of the United States for years signed their executive orders or not their executive orders, but everything they did in legislation, they'd have a number of Parker pens on the desk, they'd sign it. You probably would never think Parker Penn's world headquarters were in Janesville, Wisconsin. And that's where I taught high school. That's where I met my wife. That's where I have kids living today. Parker Penn isn't there anymore. It got sold, then sold, then sold. And I think last thing I know is maybe in France. Now, not only did we lose the four to 500 jobs, but we lost the board of directors. We lost that intellectual capital that drove that. Raleigh McClellan was the head of the locally owned bank. Skip Bliss was company fam Bliss family owned the newspaper. Truly, truly, um, even the hospital was locally owned. Bill Ryan from the hospital, Skip Bliss from the newspaper, Raleigh McClellan from the bank, and the president of Parker Penn could get in a room and almost pivot the entire city overnight. None of those exist anymore. None of those, of course, the gentlemen don't. Um, Raleigh's still alive, the rest are not. But those companies don't exist. And the other thing that's been happening with that is we've been exporting our talent. Just out of curiosity, how many of you have an adult child? Raise your hand. How many of you do you have an adult child that no longer live in your area? Bingo. We have been so great to big cities. I am hope Charleston's writing you checks. I hope Columbia is dropping you a check because let me explain what I mean by that. Um, we just did a search for a, a baseball president of a white team up in Wisconsin. We paid $43,000 to a search firm to find us a president of that baseball team. 
That meant he went and found talent, it was from Madison, Wisconsin, brought it to Beloit. We have been exporting talent from small and mid-market cities and counties like you to big cities for five decades for nothing. So what we've been losing is migration. So what I'm here to talk about, if you can only think of one thing, is called reverse migration. Now, I would not have called it that when I first started. I didn't even know what, what I was doing when I first started this. But it comes down to one thing. Whoever has the talent wins. So how do you get talent? So the burning platform we found, not right away, it took us about eight years to find it, figure out a burning platform, and I'll talk about that in a bit. What can people rally around? Talent. What can people rally around? Keeping my children home. What can people rally around? My grandkids. No longer like in Baldwin County, where they have Gulf Shores, Foley, and Orange Beach, do they fight with each other? Because while they fight over something, the place ends up going somewhere else. Once you get them into your area, you got them in your area. So what I'm talking about today is if you don't have these anymore, who replaces these icons used to drive a community? Now, let me tell you what I learned from Jim Clifton. Here's what his research showed. Spend your time retaining the local companies that receive revenue from outside the area. So let me just, and I don't hear well, so I gotta get real close. You own a company, right? And do you sell your product only in your, this city? All over the country. Out of curiosity, give me a ballpark revenue figure. $2 million. Most of that comes from outside here, right? And where do you live? So where does that money go to? Here. He is the type of people, the person you want. It's companies that get their revenue from outside your area and then spring it back to your area spend it. So all the people that buy his product, even in China, isn't it nice to finally have China giving us money instead of us giving them money? Anyway, um, basically what, what's happening is that's what he said. Then he said, make sure everybody knows who those companies are because they're not selling local. So you might not know them. They might not be at the chamber meeting because you know what? They might be traveling because they don't sell local. They might not be a part of the rotary meeting. You might not hardly know these people, but you better stay close to them because here's the secret. You can move your company very easily. Overnight, you can move your company. You know why? Because you don't have local customers. So those are the companies you got to love. Number two is how are you growing? Thriving cities grow entrepreneurs. They figure a way to get the young people or even older people money to start their own business. How old are you gonna start your own business? 35. And probably somebody had to give you some money or you got it from your family. Yeah, that's nice. That's nice. You've got to help entrepreneurs grow. That's where that local bank comes in at, at times. Now, when I say vibrant downtown, it doesn't mean you have to have a vibrant downtown. But guess who likes vibrant nightlife? Young people. They want fun. And if you don't have fun, they'll go to Charleston. They'll go to Columbia because they want vibrancy. That's how we united our people to invest in our downtown. Because people said, well, I don't live in the downtown. Why should I invest in the downtown? I said, it's not investing in a downtown. It's investing in talent, bringing talent home. In one of the chapters in my book, it's called Get Wealth Off the Sidelines. We talked about that a lot at dinner tonight. When I go to communities many times, I, I'm not here to do this. I'm here to do something for Northeastern. This is just, you know, Dr. Wagner said, well, as long as you're in town, can you do this also? Um, but, but the reality is I usually meet with the wealthier people in the area. And some of these people have their money in Schwab, had their money in wealth management, as I do, because I sold my company. Um, and I try to talk them into loosening up a little bit and doing some things downtown. Some of you wrote the question, what do you do with these empty buildings downtown? You find somebody to buy them and you find somebody to fix them up. Because if you have empty buildings downtown, it's like having teeth missing from your mouth. Those gaps, people walk by. Now, there's creative ways to do that because you don't want people to lose money. There's creative ways to do that. The other thing is spend a little money on market research. 
because market research will tell you what will work and what won't work because you don't want companies not to work. When you get my book and get it for free, if you want, grab it tonight, read about the Pensacola Business Challenge. We learned that in Asheville. All we did was put Pensacola on it. We found an empty building, it was halfway decent, and we ran a contest. Um, the person that owned it agreed to give free um, reduced rent for three years. Well, that's like they're getting nothing right now. And then they got 25,000 in cash. We had a contest. This is what told us we had a lot of entrepreneurs in town. The Small Business Development Center ran it with us. And we said, come and listen how you can get really $50,000, $25,000 worth of rent, $25,000 capital. We had over a hundred people show up, 33 completed business plans at the end of it. And we had judges pick the final eight and then they picked the final one, which is Carmen's Lunch Bar. You can look it up, it's still going in Pensacola, Florida. And two other businesses started a company because they had a business plan. So I'll talk a little more about that. Now, I normally don't put the bonus on here because a lot of small and mid-market cities don't have a local college, technical school or university. So you don't wanna put something up there and give people a reason to say, yep, we, we can't do it because we don't have one of those, you do. Now the question is, how do you continue to maximize it? You're also pretty fortunate. And you have one that grew from 850 students to 1900 students right now. So that's pretty cool what's going on here. But sometimes when it's local, you don't really realize it, what you've got, but you've got something that most cities and counties your size and counties around you would love to have. So change. Tomorrow for Dr. Wagner, I'm gonna do a workshop. Any kind of show up, feel free to spend the morning with me if you don't get too nauseous of me. I'm sure it'd be fine. Um, on change management, I was on the curriculum from be the Harvard Business School and we developed what's the most important skill set a leader needs to change. Well, if that's true, then so does elected officials. So does anyone in the community. They gotta be experts in change management because we don't, oh, we don't get it. So let me walk you through John Cotter's work in change management real quick. And he's a Harvard professor on change. Birch got on that burning platform. I don't know what yours is and it could be different. Our burning platform was we've got to quit exporting our talent. In fact, after a big referendum, because we wanted to do a project that some people didn't want, when we won the referendum, Channel 3, ABC said, Quinn, is there anything you'd like to say? I said, yeah, you can call your children and tell them it's time to come back home. Our biggest, some of our successes is Bubba Watson. I don't know if any of you golf or follow golf. Bubba Watson is a two-time master champion that's from Pensacola, Florida. In fact, he just did an interview talking about how the community saved his life. Bubba's wife is from Toronto. Now, if you've ever been to Toronto and you've ever been to Pensacola, there is a huge, huge difference. They have more cranes in one day than we've had in our entire 450 year history. Bubba wanted to live in Pensacola because he's a mama's boy. If you remember the first time he won the masters who was out on that green with him when he was sobbing and sobbing, it was his mom, Molly. In fact, she works for him at the driving range right now. But Angie just said, I love you, Bubba, but I just don't think I can do Pensacola. And so they lived in Orlando. They lived in a subdivision. In fact, he bought Tiger Woods house. Remember when Tiger Woods got in trouble? Bubba got a heck of a deal right then on the house and, and redid it. And that's where they live. Well, Bubba started coming to Pensacola Blue Wahoo games when he came into town. And he stayed downtown instead of on the beach. And his wife got up and started walking downtown. And she knows there's coffee shops downtown. There were little places to buy things downtown. And she came back and she said to Bubba, I could live in Pensacola, Florida. That afternoon, Bubba Watson bought a house. He also donated $1.6 million to the hospital. He also bought, opened a candy store. He also opened a driving range. He also invested in apartments downtown. That's called getting your talent back. And do you know the amount of publicity he gives Pensacola on 60 Minutes, on the interview he just did, on the new book coming out? We don't have all of those, but one of my favorite days is I was, Ron Jackson and his wife and his daughter and son-in-law were having coffee out one of the, people love eat, eating and drinking outside, coffee in the morning. And his son-in-law was from Atlanta. Then his daughter and him, they lived in Atlanta. 
and he looked at me, he called me up after that day and said, guess what, they're coming home. My daughter's coming back home. And you want to know what, she's pregnant. We're gonna have our grandchild now in Pensacola. You know why? Because they say they can live here. Next is critical mass. I'm gonna talk about critical mass. You gotta get enough people with you to get the momentum tipping over. Small wins. You know what our, our first small win was? One corner on one, one corner of one intersection. Ray Gindros of Pittsburgh said, every great downtown has a cool intersection. We actually had him help us pick the intersection. Do you know it had two empty buildings and two empty lots, but he said, that's the right place. That's the right place. It started out with a coffee shop and an olive oil store. People said, what the heck do we need an olive oil store for in Pensacola, Florida? You can go to the grocery store and get cheap olive oil. Well, I don't know, but they, we've sold $800,000 worth of olive oil every year. People must be bathing in this stuff right now because people want experiences. They can go to, and again, there's nothing wrong with franchises, nothing wrong with that, but people want experiences. We went to your downtown Mexican restaurant for dinner tonight. You know what I liked about it? Great service, great food, and a clean bathroom. That might not seem like a lot, but I think that's pretty neat. I'd rather go there and get a, an experience there because I can get an experience in other places any city in the United States. We talk about consent versus consensus, and I'm going to talk about turbulence here before I'm done. So if you want to, try to remember this. Capital follows talent, but talent follows place. We are in the first generation where young people choose where they live then look for a job. It's never been like that before. Never been like that. You said your daughter said she's moving to Charleston. And you said, there's a job in Columbia. And she said, good, I'll commute from Charleston to Columbia. What I'm saying is people, young people will pick a place then they look for a job. So what do young people look for? Well, they look for affordability, but not really. Because let's face it, if they look for affordability, they'd be in all our communities. Do you know how much cheaper it is to live in Pensacola, Florida than Jacksonville, than Tampa? in Nashville, my gosh, they all want to live in Nashville. I'm glad it's getting so crowded. There's no other places you can live. Um, you know, they, they want to live in these, they'll pay, they'll squeeze into a place if it's a cool place, but they do like affordability if possible. But you know what they really want? Opportunity and vibrancy. That's why growing an eco entrepreneur system is important. That's why technical colleges are important. And that's why figuring out how to create fun stuff. And we'll talk about that before I'm done. And I wrote the last thing, that's till they have kids. Then once they have kids, they start paying a little bit of attention to the educational system. But when they're 23 and 24, they're not thinking of kids. They're, they're thinking of someone to have a kid with maybe, but they're thinking about, you know, having fun, doing things, and we'll show you some stuff later. So that's, that's quality of life. So these are four gears of quality of life I'm going to talk about today. How do you raise the civic IQ? Do you know that if somebody gets hit by a car 25 miles per hour, they're gonna live? 35 miles per hour, four out of 10 will die. 45 miles per hour, eight out of 10 will die. Can you imagine, Mayor, if you announced you were gonna change all your speed limits in your city to 25? It'd be fun, because you wouldn't have to worry about being the mayor next time anymore. People go crazy, but maybe not if they were educated on what you were trying to do, which is save lives. And I'm not saying that everywhere, but we did that on one of our streets. Our mayor went from a 45 to 25, went a four lane highway to a two lane highway and created angle parking on the two lanes and a bike lane. Now it wasn't everywhere, it was four blocks, but there was a cool four blocks because they wanted to activate. So we have civic IQ, downtown or vibrancy, economic development and education. So when I talk about downtown, here's people always say, well, how do you do it? Couldn't we get more people living down there? The challenge is they're not gonna live at a place that isn't fun. So there's four things of a great downtown. Number one, you have to program the heck out of it. Most cities have something that sort of does it, but every weekend, every possible moment you have, somebody's gotta wake up every day and say, what are we doing to bring people downtown? Sometimes you just get lucky. Columbia, Mississippi. Columbia, Mississippi had a, a hurricane, I think, with Tina years ago. They had a really wealthy guy from New York that owned a company came down because his company was doing something for Tina. He fell in love with a Columbia, Mississippi woman. Married her, moved his company to Columbia, Mississippi. Um, but they had a dog of a downtown. 
Well, for Christmas one year, he spent $100,000 putting Christmas tree lights downtown. And all of a sudden, people started showing up at 5 o'clock waiting for the lights to come on. Next thing you know, a coffee shop showed up. Next thing you know, a little restaurant showed up. And now it's got it's already buzzy downtown. But it starts with programming. Next, it really looks at placemaking on purpose. Asheville and we all should, we took, we take the city and you look at every building and say, based on research, what should go in that building? What could happen here? They said in Asheville, we need a bookstore. So they figured out how to privately fund a bookstore. And they have a very successful independent bookstore because it's not the bookstore, it's the experience. Then you do things like office space and the hope of hope is you get more population. Because the more people you get in a community, the more shoppers you get and so on. So this is downtown. Now, again, it doesn't compare to yours, but it didn't look like this 15 years ago. That was a, that's an office building. There was, hadn't been a new office building built in over 30 years. Now there's three of them. That's a residential unit that had not had any residential unit. Now that's the first one. And you can see programming with festivals, programming with New Year's Eve, programming or retail and entertainment and retail and entertainment. So let's go to the thing that's closest to my heart. This is John List. He's the Department of Economics at the University of Chicago. I met John totally by accident, but he said human capital, talent is the community's greatest resource. You know how he said to measure kindergarten readiness? I don't know your kindergarten readiness, but that is the most important metric you've got in your county. Because that's gonna talk about the future of your children and the future of your city and your county. If a child is ready for kindergarten, they'll probably do well in school. But you know, when kids aren't doing well in school, who gets the blame? Could be the parents, but you know who it really usually is? The school system. Those teachers, if those teachers, I'm here to give you my viewpoint, I don't think it's the teachers. I don't think those kids are ready for kindergarten. And it's not because mom doesn't love them, but sometimes mom and dad don't know the power they have of developing their child's brain. The University of Chicago is where we got this idea and they did it and they did a whole bunch of research with moms. They had moms of different races, had different beliefs, different financials. They had a completely diverse, some moms having their first kid at 37, some moms having their first kid at 16. Completely different moms, except for one thing. They all love their child. But how do you teach a mom to build the brain? When they leave a hospital, we teach them how to breastfeed, talk about bathing, but we don't talk about the most important thing is building the brain. I know, you, I know your babies aren't delivered anymore in your area, but we've got to get the hospitals around here. When they deliver a mom from your area, they need to work with that mom on how to build the brain, and I'll talk about that. This is Dana Suskin. If you want to look at the research, it's a book called 30 Million Words. She's a cochlear implant surgeon, and what she basically found out is when her, her children, would, their brain, no, they could start hearing about brain development. What they learned is 88, 85% of the brain's, the brain's learning capacity is developed by age three. And it's based on how many words and conversation they hear. They also recommend not allowing a child to their 18 months old to look at a video screen because they don't think it's healthy for the baby's brain. I look at this all the time now. Do you know mothers, or excuse me, children are hearing less words now, not more words? Why are they hearing less words? The iPhone. I, I now look at strollers where the baby's facing out. And I don't like it. I think they should be facing in. I'm a nut job at our town when I see people now with little kids. My kids would have been a lot smarter if I had known this early on. They talk about when you change a baby's diapers, what you do. My whole deal was speed. I was like a NASCAR pit crew changing a diaper. It wasn't let's have a conversation for crying out loud. Um, so the reality is we call it um, this, this whole idea of a talk with, talk to. Um, so we really got into this. Our whole community decided on a burning platform, we're gonna be an early learning city. So we're gonna integrate learning throughout our entire, when I say city, I mean county, we sort of go back and forth. Um, so that's 30 million words from radio to TV, you name it. Now, we also found out before they leave a hospital, let's make sure they're educated, mom is. So every mom gets a tutorial on an iPad on how to build the brain, then they walk out with a package. 
Wouldn't it be neat for every mom that's born in the hospitals around here to get one of these brain bags if they're from this zip code area? Because it would make, by the way, it's very inexpensive. You know why this is so inexpensive? The nurse is already paid by the hospital. So it's very easy to do. And we do research. We also have peer review research from the University of Chicago that shows we're turning the dial. You wanna get a great community, if you can only do one thing, get the kids ready for kindergarten. Well, then we, we brought in Harvard. We brought in Ronald Ferguson. He's the national expert on how to reduce the achievement gap. And he told us that Harvard was starting something called the basics. So we said, well, how do you get in it? And he told us it's very inexpensive once again. A mom or dad can sign up for basics through in Pensacola and um, they put down their child's name and their child's age. And then two times a week, you would get a text that tells you what your, where your child should be on brain development and what you should be doing to develop your child's brain. Now, it also gives you the data. So when the kid's around three, you can be talking to mom or dad about voluntary pre-kindergarten. You, we also, you can put your own text in for text a month. So if you want to talk about nutrition, you can pop it. Now, because we are the first city to do this, we were part of their peer reviewed research. And now we have peer reviewed research that shows this work. This is $6 a year per kid. Now we've been lucky because we have private people, philanthropists that say, I'll pay for these kids. I want every money to have this opportunity. Both of these are extremely inexpensive and real doable. Economic development, instead of looking at how to bring outside companies in, we look about how to build inside companies. Um, if you recognize that, that's Cedric Alexander. He's on TV quite a bit. Um, anyway, we looked at what skills do small business people need to be successful. We did the business challenge I told you about. We do a yearly thing called Entrecon for small businesses. and We have round tables. We have round tables where we bring in small businesses and they work with an experienced business person on how to grow their company. And then there's online learning for those that can't come. That's what we did for the first four to five years. And we start out with four classes and now they're 19. So you grow, but this is what it looks like now. It's called an eco entrepreneurial system. And what I know you can't see it, but what that is, is every single resource is available for a business in Escambia County, Florida. Now we also, through private funding, not everything I've talked about is no government funding. Because if you can privately fund it, it's better to let the government keep their money in the police, fire and infrastructure and those things. And private funding is good because who benefits if we have a more successful business world? The businesses and so on. Um, so what happens here is, we have something called the spring. And the spring is a one-stop shop. So they go to the spring or they go online to the spring, they go through an intake session, and then they're sort of pushed, you know, given resources on where they should go. Um, and this is really a neat experience. Um, it, it just is, and that includes things like job shadow. Because if you wanna keep talent home, you work with your school district. In fact, I'm doing a whole workshop next week on school districts and healthcare because you want job shadowing and work experience. And once kids start to know people in the work world, they're more likely to stay in your community. So this is something relatively, it's about two years old now. People know, if you wanna know what businesses are looking for, space, money, or training. Some of them need all three, space, money, or training. So as I wrap up here, let me talk about civic engagement. This was the last thing we did, and I should have done it earlier. It was really helping the community raise their IQ. Why should you do some of the things you do? Sort of what we're doing today in a way. So what we did is again, through private funding, we got experts around the country. In fact, one of them's from South Carolina. I don't know if you've ever heard of a guy named Joe Riley from Charleston, South Carolina. He came to Pensacola and spent a day and a half with us. Um, we've had Donald Shoup from parking, by the way, and I don't think you have to worry right now, but when you get to the point where people are complaining about not finding parking, that is a good, good thing. Say so, so that is when you've won. Um, so we bring in these experts, um, diversity. 
We have brought in the top experts in the world on diversity. Emily Talon from the University of Chicago came in and talked about social equity. How come the, how do you create equity so people in lower poverty and more poverty neighborhoods get some of the same cool stuff as in other neighborhoods? Michael Pride came in and talked about streets and safety. Um, and I'll show you some of these. And here's the beauty every one of them we videotaped, and every one of them you can watch for free. So even though we paid for it, you can watch them all for free. We had Ed McMahon from the Yale Urban Lance Institute talk about community character, some things I didn't know. Um, he talked about what demand the people that come into your community use good building structure, good character. Do you know Taco Bell's got three types of design? How many of you have ever seen a Taco Bell? Don't they all look alike? Well, they all look alike if you let them all look alike. If you tell them that maybe you don't want it to look like that, they, they will change it. So we made them turn theirs. So they didn't have a parking lot between them and the street. Because when you have a parking lot, people don't want to walk by it. So we made them move it. Publix grocery store, they had to move so they created a streetscape, but they're parking on the other way. Do you know the most successful Taco Bell in the country is in a house? It's in Aspen, Colorado, because I said, if you want to be in our community, you've got to be fit the rest of the community. Sometimes we lower the bar and we get a little too open to things. And this was controversial, putting in an overlay district, things like that. Um, but this was really, really important for what happened. You create a certain sense of neighborhood. And that's what I find. You know, people want neighbors. People want neighborhoods. Um, it's interesting, you know, air conditioning is a beautiful thing, but it also hurt neighborhoods. People don't go out and, on their porch. They don't go out and play on the street anymore. So what we're trying to do is create neighborhoods. Um, Here's some of the topics we've had. From market research to resilient waterfronts, we have waterfront getting parking right. Um, and they're all available to you. And that picture was taken um, when we won the 2019 Strong Towns Award. So let me close with Chuck Yeager. Um, if you wanna have a good three and a half minutes tonight, go on some search engine and hit right stuff, Chuck Yeager. Ed Harris is in the movie and let me talk about Chuck Yeager. My parents, my dad's deceased now, my mother lives next door to me. Anyway, um, and she's probably wondering where I am tonight too. I'm probably gonna get grounded for being here. She's 96. When I tell her I'm going out of town, here's what she says, you're deserting me again, huh? Anyway, um, so basically in their condo, they have a library. And years ago, I picked up a book and it was Chuck Yeager. I loved the book. Chuck Yeager was a test pilot. Chuck Yeager got, was born too early or he might've been an astronaut, one of our first astronauts. And he was one of the test pilots out West trying to break what they thought was the sound barrier. The problem is they didn't know what the sound barrier was. So Chuck Yeager and a whole bunch of test pilots would go up and try to get these planes to fly as fast as they could. That was dangerous. There were crashes. If you watch the movie, you can see Chuck Yeager's wife played by Barbara Hershey. Um, you can see that she didn't think this was a good idea. You can see some other, you know, there's always jealousy. I don't know if you have jealousy in your community. Um, you can always tell a healthy community when people are happy when somebody else is successful. That's the healthy community. In fact, here's my test for a healthy community. If you had a project, and let's say it's here in this town, town, and uh, somebody was gonna build something and they were gonna bid it out to four architects. Two of the architects were in your county and then one of them was in Columbia and one of them was in Charleston. And they all put in bids and it's a pretty neat project and they all wanted it. Well, they picked one of the firms, architectural firms, and they started calling them. The first one they called is in your county and they told them they didn't get the contract. Does that other architectural firm in your county, do they want, and they, who do they want? That company that didn't get it. So after they said they didn't get it, do they encourage them to hire the other local architectural firm, or would they prefer them get one in Columbia and one in Charleston because they see the other one as a competitor? It's like Chillicothe, Ohio. I was in Chillicothe, Ohio. They're in the journey, just like many of us in our thing. 
they got their first restaurant down called, called The Poor. You know, not P-O-O-R, P-O-U-R. Anyway, uh, The Poor. And so I had dinner there. I had dinner there. And um, so I talked to him and I said, how would you feel if another restaurant came to Chillicothe, Ohio right now? I said, I wouldn't like it. I wouldn't like it. I said, well, I don't think that'll grow your town then. Because if you only have one, you have one. If you have two, it'll be much better for you. So I want you to think about this overnight because tomorrow during the workshop, I'm gonna ask you this exact same question. And I did and he said, I'd like it. My wife had the first coffee shop in downtown Pensacola. There are now three of them and a Starbucks. And we, every time they asked us, we had to say, we think it's good because it is good because you wanna have a vibrancy. So if you watch the movie, the government guy who's sort of supporting this thing is watching it. Chuck Eager goes up in his plane. Now the challenge is when you hit certain speeds, the plane wasn't built for some of these speeds. So the plane would start shaking. Now picture yourself driving a car down the road and it starts shaking. What would you do? Would you accelerate or would you break? Most of us would break. It's common sense. Now don't take this word wrong. Chuck was a little off balance. Chuck was a sort of a little crazy. He kept the throttle down. And all of a sudden, if you watch the movie, and I'm hoping it'll ruin it too much for you, um, there's a big explosion. And because they have never heard a sonic boom, everybody thinks Chuck has bit the dust. His wife, you can see, thinks she's lost her husband. The government guy thinks this is it for the program. Um, people that supported him felt terrible. Some of his, another pilot looked like, I told you this was going to happen. You should have listened to me. And they all looked extremely sad. Then all of a sudden, somebody looked up and they saw some exhaust type white exhaust. Fire. And somebody said, look, and there was Chuck Yeager. If you watch the movie, you see that once you hit that sonic boom, it goes smooth. What I've learned is every community is going to go through turbulence. I'll give you an example, Mayor. Fort Walton Beach. They were losing a lot of firefighters. Have you ever been down to the Destin area at all? Anybody ever here at Destin? Okay, if you're a firefighter, would you rather be in Fort Walton Beach or Destin? Well, they're losing a lot of people to Destin, okay? So they decided as a city council to put a fire fee on, you know, put a fire fee on because they needed to raise salaries so they don't lose these firefighters. Now being in the medical world, not only do firefighters strike fires, they usually have the paramedics with them, the emergency medical personnel with them. And I don't know about you, but if, if you were having a heart attack, I don't know if you'd get real excited if I was a paramedic and I had new training. <laughs> Orientee, here I am. Well, so what happened is, of course, the city council voted for it. And then once it was announced, they got pushed back. But see, they had gone through this training. It was pretty cool because you know what the message was? We got to keep the throttle down because if we're going to keep our wonderful city employees, we've got to pay competitive salaries and we want to save lives. We don't want to keep having turnover with these life-saving individuals. Same thing with education. That's where your taxes go. So if you watch this, you're going to feel good. And I say that because there's never been a project in any community that there ain't pushback. There's never been a project where there isn't turbulence. And you're a mayor, right? And you hear things like everybody. Have you ever heard that? Everybody's unhappy. I've never seen the whole town as unhappy as they are. I'm going to give you, you can tell them they're wrong. Because your town's never agreed on anything in their whole life, if you know what I mean. We don't all agree. So that's why we do the metrics. We actually do a dashboard. But there's going to be turbulence. But you know what's wonderful? When you go through the turbulence and the decision's the right one, all of a sudden, a lot of people, remember I supported you on that. I was with you right, right from the start. So I think elected officials have to have really strong legs. They have a, have to have a lot of courage and they don't hear a lot of positives. You know, I don't know if you're loaded, you say, let's give the city council meeting some extra time because so many happy people are here tonight or every letter to the editor is positive. Why don't we give our elected officials here a nice round of applause? So let's wrap it up. The world belongs to people like Chuck Yeager. They belong to people like you. 
The world belongs to people that believe that we can do something that people tell us we normally can't do. And what is that? Create the type of community that our children don't want to leave. Our children that left come back and even be some friends with them. Thank you very much for allowing me to be here tonight. Well, we absolutely thank you very much. Uh, Quint will be here for a little bit afterwards. If you want specific questions. Uh, and don't forget your free book. Uh, that's Deal. Uh, and it's very well written. I, about a third of the way through mine. And it's excellent written. And I did, I did overlook Dr. Kyle Wagner is the president of Northeastern Technical College. Dr. Greg McCord is on the board. Tom Hart is on the board. And these are two of my, or 12 board members put this here tonight. Thank you all for coming. Hopefully you've got something you can take home and start thinking about how you can make your community vibrant. Thank you. If you enjoyed the tonight, Northeastern Technical College would like to kick a series off like this. We have a new marketing campaign called Make Your Mark. And we're challenging our students to define what their mark will be. And we're asking our communities to do the same thing. So if you feel the series is important and you know people that would help Northeastern Tech College bring more of these activities to the community, we are more than willing to sponsor them and bring them to our community. We see this as a key to our community to grow our community. So thank you a lot for coming and we appreciate your support at Northeastern Technical College. <laughs>